Welcome to Lit Crit as Fuck, the audio experience in which I say shit about stuff and you listen to junk. Previously, a long time ago, on this thing that I'm doing, Yvonne had written an article a while back about the ecclesiastical courts, and there was a little bit of a discussion about it. We established it. Alyosha's becoming a monk, because he loves God and Jesus. And Fyodor Pavlovich is obsessed with Grushinka, and Dmitri is obsessed with Grushinka, and they don't like each other. I talked about the fact that Smirnikov was a psychopath, and he killed cats when he was a kid. Remember? Remember that? And I made you go, hmm, I wonder what that Smerjikov fellow is up to. He seems like he might be up to a little bit of no good. Quickly in passing, Fyodor Pavlovich points out Smerjikov is trying to show off some sort of academic prowess to impress Ivan. And Alyosha gets a letter from Lisa asking him to marry her, but then she pretends that she didn't mean it, even though she does mean it. Title card. The Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Part 5. Screw you, Jesus. So real quick, Alyosha meets with Lisa. She admits that she really did want to get married and they get engaged. Then Alyosha goes to Fyodor Pavlovich is where he comes across Smirjikov who's playing a guitar. Smirjikov with a guitar, guys. Smirjikov with a guitar. Alyosha asks Smirjikov if he knows where Dmitri is and Smirjikov says, I am not your brother's keeper. Ding, ding, ding. That's going to come up later. Keep it in mind. And then Smirjikov complains a lot, a lot, a lot about the fact that Dmitri just won't stop bothering him about Grushinka and all the junk and that he's afraid of him and that Dmitri's going to like kill him or something and then he's like okay fine i'll tell you where he's gonna be he's going to meet your brother yvonne at this tavern but don't tell dimitri i told you that because i'm scared of him he's so scary i'd like to make a point of stating how i think dimitri is very violent and capable of murder also i'm not your brother's keeper alyosha goes to this tavern and yvonne is there but dimitri is not alyosha and yvonne sit and talk for a while yvonne loves life or does he I don't know. They gossip a little bit about what just happened at Katya's house and laugh at Alyosha getting all assertive and aggressive and and saying junk. And Yvonne laughs at himself because he's like, oh, I was such a boy about stuff and and I was like in love and that's stupid. And Alyosha's like, no, I thought you were a riddle, but now I think I know something about you and that's that you're a person because I can identify with you in that you have emotions and I saw you be vulnerable. And it was nice to see you be vulnerable, bro. Now, Ivan is kind of realizing this about himself as well. He states a very passionate lust for life, which seems as though it almost came upon him in the wake of his being rejected by Katya and the surprise of how he reacted to it. Ivan says, quote, Do you know I've been sitting here thinking to myself that if I didn't believe in life, if I lost faith in the woman I love, lost faith in the order of things, were convinced, in fact, that everything is a disorderly, damnable, and perhaps devil-ridden chaos, if I was struck by every horror of man's disillusionment, still I would want to live. And having once tasted of the cup, I would not turn away from it till I had drained it. I want to live all the way, and I want to live despite... Despite logic, he says, I want to live in the face of all of this terrible shit. And he's gonna make a very good argument that fuck God. But first, Alyosha's like, what's gonna happen with Dad and Dmitri? I mean, this this is crazy, right? Like, they're I'm I'm worried. And Yvonne's like, dude, will you just calm down already about the whole Dmitri and Dad thing? Am I Dmitri's keeper? Oh shit, he said the thing. Now I'm gonna tie a little piece of string from that to what Smirjikov said in the last chapter which was precisely I am not your brother's keeper there's like a bunch of papers up on my wall and there's a string from those two statements and and that's what you need to picture right this second do it now look it wasn't an accident that both Smerdjikov and Yvonne said this exact same thing within a chapter of each other that's all I'm saying and then Yvonne turns to the camera and he says but that's not what we're here for you're not here to listen to us talk about Dmitri or Fyodor Pavlovich or Grushinka or Katya or any other characters. No, 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 gentle reader. For you are here to read very long, complicated, hard to follow questions about life and God and morality and mortality and free will without answers. That's what you're here for. You're here to discuss the big questions. And that's why we're here because we're characters in this book. And Alyosha's just like, who are you talking to? Why do you keep looking away and acting like you're talking to somebody over there? And Yvonne's like, you wouldn't understand. 
Alyosha says you speak with a strange air, as though you're not quite yourself. Ivan is not well. Something's wrong with him. He isn't okay. Alyosha is pointing out that something's a little off with his brother. What's going on here? You okay, buddy? Just keep that in mind. Ivan goes on to describe in painful detail specific cases of innocent children being abused, tortured, and murdered in different ways. And I am not interested in giving the details of any of those accounts. This chapter is really dark and upsetting because it's Yvonne trying to point out that life is awful and he does a good job. He makes everybody go, I hate everything. He just makes you sad. But, 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 all of these things happen because we have free will, because we have knowledge, because we have the ability to do them. For us to get back into the garden, well, first we had to have actually eaten of the apple, right? And then when we ate of the apple, we became capable of of insert list of things done to children. This is the cost of the knowledge that we gained when we fell. And it's the knowledge that is necessary for us to then go back. We needed to leave the garden so that we could have all of this free will and then make these choices and then get judged for them. So if somebody does some unspeakable thing to a child, should they be forgiven? And who has the right to forgive that person for such an evil act? And Alyosha says... Well, you know, Jesus. Yvonne's so pleased when he finally brings up Jesus. I was waiting for you to bring him up. Your people, they're always bringing up the Jesus immediately when we have these conversations. The segues. This is a segue. Now, we're going to talk about a little thing called the Grand Inquisitor. Shit just got real. Okay, I'm going to tell you this story. So we're in Seville, and it is the Spanish Inquisition. According to Yvonne, within the universe of this story that he's put together, Jesus has actually come back a few times. None of these have been the time that he will return as promised by God and him in the Bible and so forth. It's not the big return. He sort of cheats and he comes back every so often and checks in. And then he's like, hey, what's up? I'm only here for a bite to eat. And so this time he decides, I'm going to go check out what's going on with that Inquisition thing. Mm, let's see what's up with that. So he appears in Seville and pretty immediately everyone knows who he is. All of the people in the streets just are like, holy shit, it's him. He does some miracles. He does a little Jesus-y stuff. He restores a guy's sight, brings somebody back from the dead. And the people are like, woo, Jesus, you're the best. And then suddenly the Grand Inquisitor shows up. Yeah, sure, Jesus is there, but holy shit, the Grand Inquisitor just got here. Everyone act natural. Because the Grand Inquisitor is significantly more powerful than Jesus. But how is this possible? And so just to, you know, kind of drive that home, the Grand Inquisitor has Jesus arrested and not a single person moves to stop him because this man, he's in charge. So Jesus is going to be executed in the morning. The Grand Inquisitor comes to talk to him like you would. You know, I mean, you got Jesus in a cell. You're going to be like, hey, let's talk. Except he doesn't go to talk for like guidance or out of love. He goes to tell Jesus what a fuck up he is. Jesus done goofed. So he goes to explain to him that the church, we really don't need you. You're just kind of a hindrance to us. Remember when the devil came to you and he offered you the three temptations? You should have took those. Instead of giving everybody just free will and kind of being like, yeah, guys, you do you and um, and then I'll be back later to judge you on it. Instead, you should have stayed and you should have been like a ruler and you should have helped people have the things that are necessary to survive and thrive in life so that they wouldn't have to suffer. So we fixed all of your mistakes and we don't really need you anymore, Jesus, because you fucked up the first time. So the church really serves Satan now instead of you. And if it's all the same to you, we're cool if you just like never come back. We don't really need you because we think that you'll probably come and try to mess with how we're doing things. And we think the way we're doing things is working. And the way you did things, it, it, it didn't work. So Grand Inquisitor is like, I'm totally gonna like have you killed and everyone's gonna be on my side. And all those people who are all happy to see you today, they're gonna be like, yeah, kill him. Woo! Because that's what they're like. They do what they're told. And then you're gonna die and it's gonna to be sad and I'm mean. And then Jesus gets up and he walks over to the Grand Inquisitor and he gives him a little kiss. And the Grand Inquisitor's like, huh? 
What's that about? Jesus was showing that no matter what you do, I still love you. And that was so powerful. That moment stayed with the Grand Inquisitor for the rest of his days. And he let Jesus go. He did not have him killed. He couldn't do it. Was it the kiss? Maybe. Was it that desire for perfect love? The desire for a being that loves us unconditionally? That even the Grand Inquisitor could not live without it once he realized it. Once he felt it. Maybe so. Everybody reading the book and um, Dostoevsky's wife were like, what does that mean? Dostoevsky was like, I'm writing a book here, people. Look, it's all going to tie together and don't think about it too much. Okay, bye. So after he tells the whole story and everything and Alyosha's like, I don't understand. If you don't have God and you don't believe in anything really at all, how are you going to endure? How are you going to keep on living? And Yvonne says, you know, I'm going to be a Karamazov. And Alyosha's like, oh, you, you don't mean being like Dmitri and dad, do you? Sinking into debauchery says you don't you don't mean that do you Yvonne's like well maybe that and Alyosha takes that as there's no god and there's no afterlife therefore everything is lawful is that what you mean by this are you gonna live by that and Yvonne gets pissed this makes him angry when Alyosha brings that up Yvonne's like oh I see yeah you're gonna go back to that thing that Musaf brought up and this is the thing that was brought up at the monastery meeting and he's so angry all of a sudden at the thought of this statement everybody seems to be misunderstanding Yvonne and somebody's misunderstanding Yvonne to the point of using Yvonne's words as a justification for murder. Whether he realizes that on any level is up for debate. Yvonne is saying things that people aren't quite understanding and that is a very lonely place to be. When it seems like Alyosha is completely misconstruing his words, he's like, well, I thought I had you at least, you know, I thought you loved me, but clearly you don't. And Alyosha gets up and walks over to Yvonne and kisses him. Yvonne laughs and he says, that's plagiarism. Alyosha always knows exactly what to do to make Make you feel better. We switch our perspective from Alyosha to Yvonne with this kiss. We start to see things through Yvonne's eyes for the first time. Once that's over, they leave. Yvonne goes back to Fyodor Pavlovich's where he's been living. He meets with Smerdyakov on the estate. Yvonne feels intense hatred for Smerdyakov, but he is still drawn to him and he's not quite sure where this hatred is coming from. Smerdyakov tries to convince Yvonne to go to Chermochnia rather than Moscow because it is closer to them. And this is in case Dmitri kills Fyodor Pavlovich which Smerdyakov seems pretty certain is going to happen and nobody's really disagreeing with him in the, on that. Ivan seems to agree as well that there's a good chance that Dmitri is going to kill Fyodor Pavlovich. The reason that Smerdyakov wants Ivan to go to Chmachnia is because it is closer to the town and so once Fyodor Pavlovich has been murdered Ivan will be able to come back quickly. Why does Smerdyakov want Ivan available for the aftermath of his father's murder? Well, I can say that unbeknownst to Ivan during this conversation, Smerdyakov is divided a bunch of the details of his plan to kill Fyodor Pavlovich and to pin it all on Dmitri. It goes something like this. Dmitri will most likely stop by. Sverdjikov will have no choice but to let Dmitri in because he's so afraid of him. Dmitri is so intimidating and will insist on it. And, you know, he's just a lowly servant. And what is he going to do? Dmitri knows the secret knocks so that he could use those knocks to fool Fyodor Pavlovich into thinking that Grushinka is there in order to get him to come out and then be able to do whatever he wants, which includes murdering him. He has what he needs to, to kill his father, which Smirjikov is pointing out. Look, look, this is perfect. He could easily do this. And Ivan says, well, just don't let him in. And he's like, well, I have to. But anyways, what if I have a seizure? I think I'm probably going to have a seizure. Ivan's like, what are you talking about? You can't tell that you're probably going to have a seizure. Smirjikov's like, no, I, I think I think I might. And Ivan's like, okay, fine. If that happens, then you can tell Grigori. And Grigori won't let Dimitri in. And Smirjikov's like, well, see, Grigori's going to have this whole thing with Marfa. She's going to be like doing this thing to ease a back problem he has, which involves a lot of vodka and they eventually drink it. And then because they don't really drink much, they usually end up passing out. They only do it once a year. So this is the night of year where they are both going to be incapacitated. What are the odds? And that's when Ivan's like, you know, it sounds like you're planning this. Like what, what's going on here? And so Smajikov keeps on just kind of trying to drive home. Like, look, your brother's going to kill your father and there's nothing I can do about it. And I'm not going to be there. I'm going to totally be innocent because look, I'm probably going to have a seizure and stuff. Smerdyakov has been plotting 
and one would assume for quite a while, to murder Fyodor Pavlovich and to frame Dmitri for it. That's right, kids. Smerdyakov is going to kill Fyodor Pavlovich. Snape kills Dumbledore! After they're done talking, Ivan enters Fyodor Pavlovich's home and just quickly goes up the stairs without really saying much to Fyodor Pavlovich. He seems angry and unwilling to deal with him in that moment. Fyodor Pavlovich is a little confused by this, wondering what's up with what's up with Ivan. He asks Smerdyakov. Smerdyakov is like, I don't know. And then they talk a little bit about Grishinka and the stuff that they tend to talk about. So upstairs, Ivan is lying on the couch and he is trying to sleep, but he is unable to. Quote, remembering that night long afterwards, Ivan recalled with peculiar repulsion how he had suddenly got up from the sofa and had stealthily, as though he were afraid of being watched, opened the door, gone out on the staircase and listened to Fyodor Pavlovich stirring down below, had listened a long while, some five minutes with a sort of strange curiosity holding his breath while his heart throbbed. The next morning comes around and Ivan is talking to Fyodor Pavlovich. Fyodor Pavlovich is trying to convince him to go to Chermochnia as well, but for a different reason. He has business there and he wants Ivan to be like an emissary for him in this business. Ivan finally relents and he tells Fyodor Pavlovich that he will in fact go to Chermochnia. But as he's getting into the carriage, Smirjikov makes a comment about the fact that Ivan is going to Chermochnia and takes a little bit of credit for it. He says, it's always worthwhile speaking to a clever man. Upon hearing this, Ivan changes his mind abruptly and he says, you know what? I'm not. I'm not going to Chermachnia. Tell my father that I've decided not to go. And then he gets into a carriage and he says he's going to Moscow and he takes off. A little bit later, Smerdyakov, he's bedridden from his fake seizure. Fyodor Pavlovich is eating subpar fish stew prepared by Marfa because... Smerdyakov is laid up after his seizure and he's lamenting about whether or not Grushinka is going to come. Next time on this crap, Father Zosima is going to talk like a super lot. (laughs) 